Hi guys and girls, I'm Reef Man, and I wanted to give you an introduction to small polyp stony corals, the different kinds that you can get, some basic care, and some information about them so that you can make a more informed decision for your tank. So as you may know, all living things uh, are in kingdoms, phylums, classes, subclasses, orders, families, genus, and species. So every living thing on the earth that's an animal is an animalia, that's the kingdom we're all in. And then the phylum for things with stinging cells, like jellyfish, anemones, coral, is cnidaria. Then the class is anthrozoa. That is all of the corals themselves, but also sea anemones, and it actually is any like flower-like animal. That's sort of what it means there. Then hexacorola is after that, and that is, uh, sorry, it's a six-fold symmetry. And if you look at polyps of coral, they're symmetrical. That's where that comes in. And then after that, you have scleri uh, sorry, scleractinia, which is the stony corals that we're going to talk about today. So we'll start off with some beginner corals. Some things that you might want to look for if you're just starting out in SPS corals are from the Pocilloporidae family. Those are things like bird's nest corals, postalopora corals. Uh, those are going to be a little bit more forgiving in your tank. Under postalaporidae, there are two genuses that you can think about including in your tank, especially as a beginner. One, very similar to postalaporidae, we have postalopora. Those are a group of 66 different species all of them form branching colonies. And if you're looking at a random coral, the distinguishing feature of a postalopora is that the branching colony has wart-like protuberances all over it. So there'll be little bumps all over the branches, the individual branches. Those don't necessarily contain what's called a corallite or an individual polyp but it's just kind of a growth on the surface of the skeleton of the coral. That's a distinguishing feature of Postolopora. These all have immersed polyps, which means that they don't have a raised corallite, a piece of skeleton that contains the polyp. And this overall surface, aside from those wart-like bumps, is going to be smooth. They like medium to high light and flow, but they're very forgiving and very fast growing in your tank. Postalopora is one of the few kinds of coral that will reproduce in your tank and can actually become a plague in your tank. So they can do sexual reproduction in your tank, which is rare for other stony corals, but they can also do something called polyp bailout, where the polyps, individual polyps, will pop out of the colony, float around your tank, and then colonize somewhere else. So you can end up with hundreds of these things growing all over your tank. The other genus in Postalaporidae is Stylophora. Now these are very similar in structure, but don't have the bumps that Postalopora has. And they don't have axial corallites, so they are going to be small polyps immersed over the skeleton, no raised bumps on the skeleton. There are 40 species of Stylophora. Now, one distinguishing thing about coral and, and how to identify it, there are things called axial polyps, which are polyps on the end of a branch, and there are things called radial polyps, or radial corallites, sorry, axial corallites and radial corallites. Uh, they are all around the outside of the, of the branches. So you might think of a radial corallite as being all the corallites around the branch of coral and the axial corallite being the one at the end. So stylophora have all radial corallites, no axial corallites, and smooth, thin branches, again, not like the postalopora. They like medium light and flow. They're very forgiving, but not quite as much as Postalopora. For whatever reason, I can't keep Stylophora in my tank. They don't do well. So hopefully they'll do better for you, but they are one of the more forgiving small polyp stony corals. So moving on, we switch the family and we go to the Acroporidae family. That contains Montipora, Acropora, and Acropora, those kinds of, of genuses. So Montipora is going to be a little bit more forgiving than the other Acroporidae corals. There are 206 species of Montipora, and they're identified as having no axial corallite, but they have very small immersed radial corallites all over them. No raised bits of skeleton surrounding the polyp, just smooth skinned uh, coral with no 
axial correlate. They are most commonly plating or encrusting. And as with Acropora and all of these things, in your tank, they might extend their, their polyps during the day, but in the wild, fish are gonna eat them during the day. So they only would extend their polyps at night most often. The polyps of Montipora are small compared to other Acroporidae. They're less than one millimeter across, and they like low nutrient water with bright, right, or with bright light, and they're similar to Acropora in care. Now, Montipora would be a good beginning Acroporidae coral. As you move up and your skill becomes better, if your Montipora are all doing really well, then your Acropora will probably also do well. So moving into more advanced species or more advanced kinds of small polyp stony coral, we have another Acroporidae, and this is Anacropora. This only has 12 species, and it is very similar to Acropora, except it doesn't have an axial correlate, so no polyp at the end of the branch, and it has very widely spaced radial correlates. Anacropora has slender branches, less than 10 millimeters thick, so nothing very massive like a staghorn coral would have. Uh, and they have blunt ends, they don't have a pointy end the way a stylophora would. They have, as I mentioned, widely spaced, small protruding radial correlates, so they're not smooth the way, say, a Montipora digitata would be. They would have bumps associated with every polyp. And to distinguish them from Acropora, Anacropora can handle a lot more nutrients in the water. So if your tank has a lot of LPS, things like that, that like a lot of food, you might consider Anacropora instead of Acropora because your tank probably has higher nutrients for the LPS that you're keeping. So that brings us to the last genus that we'll cover in Anacropora Day, and that is Acropora. There are 345 species of Acropora, and if you just picture a coral reef in your mind, what you're picturing right now is probably Acropora corals. They are by far the most common reef building coral out there, and they're also the most common SPS coral that you would get in your tank at home. The distinguishing feature of an Acropora coral is the axial correlate. They are the only kind of coral that actually has an axial correlate. And again, that's a polyp at the end of a branch, like you can see. The axial correlate is often a bright color and contrasts with the rest of the coral as well. The way these things grow, the axial correlate lays down skeleton around it. And as it grows and protrudes from the colony, radial correlates bud off from it and start filling in the gaps. There are densely packed radial correlates all over the body of an Acropora coral. And every once in a while, one of those radial correlates becomes an axial correlate and a new branch starts to grow. As I mentioned, the correlates on Acropora are densely packed. They're not widely spaced like an Acropora, and they're pretty big, two to three millimeters across on average with a correlate surrounding them um, that's protruding from the skeleton about two to three millimeters as well. Acropora is the most demanding of all these kinds of coral that we've covered. They like very low nutrients water. Some nutrients are important. Some phosphate and nitrate is important for their development, but in general, very low nutrient, very high flow, very random flow with high light. So over 150, 200 par or so will do Acropora well. All of these corals will do well being fed in your tank. You might need to turn off the lights and turn off your pumps and then target feed them things like the Pollet Lab coral food or other coral foods, um, but they will all appreciate it. They're all photosynthetic, but again, appreciate actual food every once in a while and will grow better for you if you do that. So I hope this was interesting. It'll give you an idea of what you're looking at when you're considering buying a new coral online or from a store because you know, they get names like toxic lemonade and who knows what that actually is. But if you can look at the picture and decide, oh, well, it has an axial correlate, so it's an Acropora, you'll have a better idea of the care requirements uh, for that random coral that you're looking at buying online. Getting down beyond just the genus is really difficult. You're gonna have to get into the skeleton and look at the actual shape of the correlates and things like that. Um, not something that you're gonna be able to do just from looking at the outside of the coral very easily. So I wouldn't try to really nail down too much at a species level, um, which is important, of course, for care, but you can at least get an idea just from knowing the genus. So I hope this introduction to coral taxonomy and identification was interesting. Let me know in the comments what you thought. 
Don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next week. Bye.